the roller coaster ride of the living and loving faith process in the Church of England continues. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Rev Dan. I'm a vicar in the Church of England. On this channel, you'll get my views as a parish priest on the big Christian news stories happening today. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment on anything that is said, and also click that notification bell. So the drama of the living and loving faith process, which was the process that brought same-sex blessings into the Church of England, continues after the Bishop of Newcastle has stepped down from her lead as co-chair. This follows on from last week when herself and the other co-chair of the new group formed to take the process forward. The Bishop of Leicester met with different groups from both sides of the debate at Lambeth Palace and set out what was going to come forward at General Synod in a couple of weeks' time. A lot of the Liberals were not happy. The promise of standalone blessing services, which was voted through on an experimental basis in November and thought to come in in March, is not going to happen but there wasn't any date ever put on it back in November. And also the provision for clergy who are in same-sex relationships to be married in civil ceremonies, that's being delayed as well. But again, there was no date set for that in November. So at the meeting, the bishops, the co-chairs, wanted to reset the process where we are. Doesn't mean to stop the process. The process will still continue on the direction it's travelling. Just wanted to kind of reset where we are, how we deal with each other over the strong debates that are going on and what the church looks like in the future. I did a video about that before. You can watch that here. But in between that, 130 General Synod members have written a letter to the General Synod saying this process has to carry on. You can't delay this anymore. And so there's pressure coming from all sides, of course, from my side on the conservative side of this argument. The pressure to say, look, we need to differentiate, we need to have different structures and safeguards that mean we are basically going to end up with a Church of England, but with two separate churches in that. But the Bishop of Newcastle did not step down from her position over that. Actually, it was all over the appointment of a new theological advisor to the House of Bishops. The Church Times leads with the headline, Bishop of Newcastle steps down from LLF over serious concerns about interim advisor. They go on to say, the Bishop of Newcastle, Dr. Helen Ann Hartley, is standing down as one of the co-chairs of the LLF process. She has expressed serious concerns about the recent appointment of a new interim theological advisor to the House of Bishops. To the House of Bishops, not to the LLF process, but will be heavily involved, no doubt, in the LLF process. Dr. Hartley and the Bishop of Leicester, uh, Martin Snow, were appointed last November, so only been in position a couple of months, to co-chair the LLF process. And last week wrote an article for the Church Times setting out their hope for the reset of the process. Early in the week, the vicar of All Saints New Longton, the Reverend Dr Thomas Wolford, a tutor at Emmanuel Theological College, was announced as interim secretary to the Faith and Order Commission, an advisor to the House of Bishops before a permanent post holder takes up the position in September. So this was just an interim position until September when a new person could take this up with the Bishop of Newcastle felt strongly about this to step down and focus on her ministry in her diocese. After his appointment, an article by Dr. Wolf were published in 2019 on the website Church Society, a conservative evangelical organisation in the CV, began to be circulated on social media. In the article, Mr. Wolford wrote, I think it would be disastrous and desperately wicked if the church were to prepare blessings for those things we must not bless, alter the canons to accommodate worldly thinking, give up the standard of chastity for ordained office holders, or sanction false teaching. Speaking shortly after Dr. Hartley's announcement, Dr. Wolford distanced himself from the tone of the article. I'm still a conservative on blessings and on sexuality, so that part hasn't changed, he said but I'll put a lot of things differently in the light of the journey we burn on in Synod and in the wider church. And, and to be honest, that's fair enough to say. I think a lot of us have been on journeys on this. Yes, we still hold our conviction and we won't change on that. But how we interact with others, how we speak to others, how we, uh, you know, what we've learned from this process, what we thought about and priced, processed on this process is very important. Just because he wrote this in 2019 doesn't mean he fully uh, will be where he was then when you go through a process you're going to see things differently you actually in this process start to speak to other people uh, and, and and get 
their stories doesn't mean that we change our theology on this but it will change the way that we react and perhaps the way that we speak and those are good lessons learned so to base things solely on that 2019 article without listening to what he has to say today would be would be wrong you know we one of the strong things that he's saying is yes i have learned my theology is still the same but the way i interact with people the way that i write stuff will be different today because of what we learned on the process. On Thursday afternoon, the Bishop in Europe, Dr. Robert Inns, who chairs the FAOC, said that Dr. Wolford was an advisory role, not an executive role. Now, this is a speak that I wouldn't understand, but it's obviously he's just advising. He's not part of a, an executive committee or, or anything. And remember, it's just an interim period until September. He is an advisor amongst other advisors, and advisors come from an appropriately diverse array of positions. He also emphasised that it was a six-month interim appointment. So he is an advisor amongst many advisors, and we are a broad church, so you would expect that there will be advisors for the House of Bishops on both sides, not just the LNF argument, but on other theological things that they are considering. The House of Bishops would want as much information as possible. So he is an advisor who's obviously... Re- placing uh, somebody who's left i think that's isabel hamley who was uh, who's now principal of ridley hall in cambridge who i believe is a liberal herself so um, maybe that's part of the problem a liberal leaves a conservative comes in but remember it's an interim appointment but maybe they wanted some more conservative views on this we don't, i don't know all the backstory could only speculate in one way or another but he was appointed but i'm sure that he was appointed because of his qualifications as well So the Bishop of Newcastle, in her statement, said that her first commitment and priority is to continue to respond to God's call to be Bishop in Newcastle. But it it has become clear to her in the last 48 hours that there are serious concerns relating to the process of appointing an interim theological advisor to the House of Bishops. This was and is not an LLF appointment, and neither Bishop Martin nor myself were involved in it. Whilst the remit of the theological advisor is broader than any matters relating to LLF, there is no doubt that LLF remains front and centre in the life of the church at this time. What transpired in the last 48 hours has had a critically negative impact on the work that Bishop Martin and I were seeking in good faith to do. My role as co bishop of the LLF process is now undermining my capacity to fulfil my primary calling to lead and care for the people and places of the Diocese of Newcastle. So, of course, a statement is a statement. It could say many things, uh, but what we can see in here that she wasn't happy with the appointment, there's a serious concerns about the appointment um about the appointment the process and saying there as well that the bishop martin and herself were not involved in it as lead bishops for the llf process did they need to be involved in it this was a a position for the house of bishops to advise the house of bishops it could be arguments on both sides yes he was going to be involved in the llf process because that's the big thing at the moment. But this is quite clearly the reason why she has stepped down from her role as the co-chair. So the Bishop of Leicester has issued his own statement where he says he's deeply silent by the Bishop of Newcastle's decision to stand down for the role. Um, greatly enjoyed working with her on this process. He wants to express the personal thanks for her support and engagement. He says he took the role of the co-lead for LLF out of a sense of calling to bridge building and reconciliation, both for their sake and as a core part of our Christian witness. I mean, reflect upon my position over the past couple of days, this sense of calling remains. So he's, he's going to stay there. Remember, he's, he's the bishop who would represent the uh, conservative vote and the bishop of Newcastle, the liberal vote. But remember as well that he, even though he's represented the conservative vote, he did vote back in February for LLF to happen. But their vision was to build bridges and for reconciliation in the divide that we have in the Church of England. This is why they was calling for the reset. He goes on to say... However, I recognise that confidence and trust in the LLF process is slow and that I cannot bring myself to rebuild that trust or command the confidence of the full breadth of the Church of England. So I have indicated to the Archbishops that I'm willing to continue in the role of co-lead with several provisos. So the first one, basically, he says he wants to prioritise his diocese. Uh, He's been there for eight years and so the LLF process doesn't take over that. Secondly, he says the Archbishops need to appoint a successor to the Bishop of Newcastle who commands similar respect across the House of Bishops and General Synod. It is important to model 
an approach of people with different views working well together. Thirdly, that the Secretary General will need to appoint a second interim theological advisor to the House of Bishops so that there is a similar model of working together across difference. And the co-lead bishops of the LLF must be involved in that appointment in the future. And in brackets, he puts, we were not involved in the recent process, so obviously making a statement there. The Faith and Order Commission must be made a diverse group which resources the House of Bishops carefully, rich and nuanced theological work. And lastly, he's asked for the Archbishops to consider leading a prayerful reflection at General Synod, which sets this whole process once again in the context of discernment about what sort of church we are called to be in the coming years. And that's just basically just a, a time of prayer. But, you know, what church we're called to be in the coming years again, there's, it's, it's just such a huge divide. It's all about reconciliation now. That's what the reset is. But remember, the process is going forward. The process is continuing and it's resetting relationships. And how can you reset relationships when the process, which many people are against or even for, uh, is going to go ahead. So he says he's going to bring forward commitments to General Synod that would do more to lay out the steps that we need to take to improve the transparency and accountability of the LLF process. My prayers for an honest and generous and prayerful debate. But if you notice in there that they're not going to appoint a second uh, theological advisor until uh, the other bishop will be appointed to the other process. So I expect the bishop for the co-chair will be appointed quite soon in order for the FAOC to appoint another theological advisor who will be uh, from the liberal side of the church to balance out the orthodox side. So with that, really, you know, after two and a half months being in the role of theological advisor coming in, who's a, a, a different view, and the, so the bishop of Newcastle has stepped down, is is the process is is just all over the place as it has been. Yes, he has got her a stance on that, and 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 that's quite right. She can have that, but where they're trying to show good disagreement, it doesn't come across that there's good good disagreement on this. It comes across as I do not agree with that, so I'm going to step down. You know, that's from the statement that she said, didn't agree with the process of theological advisor. It could be that um, be, she agrees with theological advisor, you know, on, on, on his orthodoxy, but it's the actual process and that they weren't involved in it. That could be a factor. There are many different conversations going on in the in the Twitter world about this and on, on, on forums. And it does seem there's questions about what's going to happen in the future and how can good disagreement be shown uh, when this has happened. So the Archbishops of York and Canterbury have put out their own statement about this. They say the LLF process has encouraged us all to learn more deeply about our own identities, those of people we love, our convictions and how we live well in the world. This has been complex and painful for many of us. And then it goes on to say although, and we know in the Bible when it's got a word like although or you know some word like that you've got to take notice. Although of course they say we continue to support robust debate around these issues where there is disagreement in our church. We are dismayed that sometimes that this has included unjust and inappropriate personal attacks. As followers of Christ, the manner in which we conduct our debate is as important as the debate itself. So that's a, that's a huge statement. That is a massive statement, really, if you think about it. They're talking about uh, we are dismayed that sometimes this has included unjust and inappropriate personal attacks. Uh, it'd be great to understand what that is. Is that part of why the bishop of newcastle has stepped down is there something that's come through you know kind of naming not shaming but naming what is going on where this is coming from will help because i'm sure that people on both sides of the argument if they're hearing people in their camp are, are doing this they will politely ask them to stop doing it it doesn't help the cause if personal attacks are happening and this is in a statement so it's obviously happening and it'd be good for them to bring stuff to General Synod to show exactly what's been happening because, you know, that it's not fair, it's not right. You know, we are all people at the end of the day. We we will disagree, but we, you know, we have to hold our integrity. We're, we're Christians and how we speak to each other is very, very important. It's not going to further the gospel uh, when people are looking at us infighting and launching, as they say, unjust and inappropriate personal attacks. Uh, but I would like to see exactly what they are. You know, this is the the thing. Uh, it's coming out where we're going along on this. Yes, the bishop has stepped down. They will get a new bishop. They get a new theological advisor. This will continue. We're still on the process of this all happening um, and continuing. In, at one point, standalone services coming in. Another point, the guidance coming in for uh, marriage of clergy and same-sex marriages, which will be a really big thing. Uh, for a lot of clergy, a big, big red line if that happens. But it's about resetting the process, how we speak to each other. But again, we are so theologically divided over this. 
and and the and the way it's going forward, you just have to go on Twitter sometimes to see some of the anger coming out. I, I'm quite I am quite shocked, and I could probably see where the archbishops are coming from, uh, of some of the language that's been spoken quite brazenly in the public domain, and uh, you know that again is not good for the Christian witness out there when Christians are, are speaking. Uh, about this and not living kingdom values of, of, of what God's called us to do and be. So what will come at General Synod in the next couple of weeks because you know this has just all happened just before General Synod. We know the Bishop of Leicester said he's going to bring commitments uh, which I can only imagine is trying to get General Synod to agree how they're going to work together, how they're going to speak to each other going forward um, but with such divides I, I, I can't see, well I don't know if it's going to be voted on or, or just an agreement but you've got to hold this process, as I said, it's still going forward. The Conservatives want a settlement that is protection and own bishops and, and own ordination process for new clergy coming through. The Liberals do not want that. They want to stay as a, a broad church. These two can't be reconciled. Same-sex blessings are currently happening at the moment. There are churches openly flouting that and doing standalone blessings, even though they're not allowed to be done. And uh, we, we wait and see and to hear if there's any disciplinaries over that, because this is what part of the LNF process is, to try and stop those things happening. And the, the bishops are saying, wait, wait, wait. And they're saying, we're not waiting, we're doing them anyway. So it is all over. It's, a, it's, it's, it's all over the place, it seems. The bishop they're going to bring back in has got to step into a big role. To tr they're going to try and reconcile these two groups. Can they be reconciled? I don't think so.